Welcome, welcome, my friends. Your timing is excellent. Chief Justice Taney and I have just put the finishing touches on my farewell address. I've signed it, and he's taken it off to the printers. I'll share some of it with you later if you like. But first, let's drink a toast to the nation, to the sovereignty of the people, to the survival of liberty. Hear, hear. This time tomorrow, it will all be in the hands of Mr. Martin Van Buren. Two terms, my friends. I've had the opportunity to serve the people of the United States for eight years. I wouldn't have expected it. I'm an ambitious man, but when I left Florida, it was only with the idea of ending an assignment I despised and returning to the Hermitage to be with my wife and sons. The 11 weeks I spent as governor of the Florida Territory <clears throat> seemed an eternity. I used Rachel's health as an excuse to resign, but mine was just as bad. I'd been carrying two bullets, one in my arm for eight years, one in my chest for 15. That one I still have, by the way. And no, they weren't war wounds. They were from the duels. Also, I contracted dysentery and malaria, and the calomel and sugar of lead I took for them seemed to make me feel worse. In the spring of 1822, my health had deteriorated to the point I knew I had to rest or die. This time gave me an opportunity to think about what was going on in the country. I knew there was something happening that was wrong. And the more I looked into it, and the more I thought about it, the more distressed I became. Corruption, and not just stealing money, though that's bad enough but people who would subvert the constitutional system of government for their own profits. There was no party to compete, compete with the Republicans nationally, and there were congressmen determined to hold a traditional caucus to nominate the next Republican presidential candidate anyway. That's as good as electing. A few men meeting in caucus to elect the president of the United States? Where were your free elections? Where is the will of the people? It was a given the one who'd be selected was William H. Crawford, then Secretary of the Treasury. He was popular with members of the caucus, and I'm sure they thought he would help them pursue their own private ends. It looked to me like Congress was about to steal the presidency from the control of the people. And here's the worst of it. Crawford had a stroke. He couldn't move. He couldn't speak. He almost couldn't see. And yet these scoundrels continued to plan their caucus for him anyway. My ward, Andrew Severin Donaldson, is my assistant. I don't think I've made a note or a list or had my name in any newspaper that Andrew hasn't kept a copy of it. Here's my letter to Congressman James Buchanan. I weep for the liberty of my country when I see the rights of the people bartered by congressmen for promises of office. My fervent prayers are that our Republican government may be perpetual and the people alone, by their virtue and independent exercise of their free suffrage, can make it perpetual. The great constitutional corrective in the hands of the people against usurpation of power is the right of suffrage. 
As I shared my concerns with others, they began to suggest that I might run for the presidency. No, I told them, I have never been a candidate for any office. I never will. But when the people have a right to choose whom they will to perform their constitutional duties, and the citizen is required to render the services, and the people call me. Of course, the Republicans, in a brief moment of wisdom, <laughs> decided they could not put a blind, deaf, dumb Crawford into the White House. <laughs> so John Quincy Adams became my principal opponent. Henry Clay was John Quincy Adams' man. And they began to do everything in their power to get Adams elected. Not one single soul in Kentucky had voted for Adams. And the Kentucky legislature instructed its delegation to vote for me in the House election. But thanks to Henry Clay, they didn't. When they disregarded the instructions of their own legislature, I knew a corrupt bargain had been sealed. It was clear from the first State of the Union address that Adams was in favor of the elite over the common people. He said, the great object of the institution of civil government is the improvement of the condition of those who are parties to the social compact. We must not give the rest of the world the impression that we are palsied by the will of our constituents. Palsied by the will of our constituents? Palsied? Great God! The will of our constituents is all that should concern us. My father, Andrew Jackson Sr., did not trade the hardships of Ireland and die trying to beat a living out of the red clay of the wax sauce so the elite could thrive. My brother Hugh was lost at the Battle of Stone Old Ferry. He didn't give his life in the sweltering heat and insect-infested swamps of South Carolina to benefit the aristocracy. My brother Robert, died of smallpox, contracted in a British prison in Camden. After getting him and me out of that prison and back to the Waxhaws, after watching my brother die and me struggle back to health, my mother died of cholera, contracted in the ships of Charleston Harbor. Did they die over men who lust after money and power over everything else? It's time for a new party to emerge, a party concerned with the preservation of liberty, a party dedicated to doing the will of the people, a party committed to democracy. And indeed, well before the next election, we had established the Democratic Party and were fighting in what I believe to be a moral conflict. It was essential that this era of corruption be ended and an era of reform take its place. I vowed that the first thing I would do upon becoming president was to reform the government and purify the departments by removing every corrupt agent who had obtained his position through political considerations are against the will of the people. Now, Adams was not without friends and supporters. And they questioned every action I had ever taken in my life, understandable to a point. But the worst, their most contemptible act was the charge that when I married Rachel, I had run off with another man's wife. Did I say they were morally bankrupt? 
do you need any further proof? Because I question their morality. They felt duty bound to question mine. But how dare they slander the sacred name of my beloved wife. Rachel. I've thought of her every day of the nine years since she died. I wear a miniature of her on a black velvet cord around my neck. And each night before I go to bed, I look at her sweet face and read from her Bible. When I met her, she was a girl, a delightful young girl, flirtatious and lively. How she loved to dance and ride horseback. She told wonderful, funny stories. And I was a wild one myself. Got into a bit of trouble from time to time when I studied law in Salisbury. After I left there, I remember somebody called me the most roaring, rollicking, game-cocking, horse-racing, card-playing, mischievous fellow that ever lived in Salisbury. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, we were perfectly matched. Unfortunately, she made an unwise marriage to the scoundrel Louis Robards, who treated her in the rudest, most disrespectful fashion. His crazy jealousy is making him more hateful to her than generally everybody else. He told a friend of mine that he thought I was too intimate with his wife. I was enraged. I confronted the man. I told him if he ever linked my name with Rachel's, I'd cut his ears out of his head, and I was tempted to do it anyway. Not long after that, Robards left her and went to Kentucky. Then we heard rumors that Robards intended to come for Rachel and take her back to Kentucky by force if necessary. She was terrified and determined to stay away from him. He couldn't touch her in Natchez. It was under Spanish control. So she decided to go there where she had friends and relatives. It was a dangerous route. The Indians a constant threat. So I joined the party as protection. Then the word came that Robards had divorced her, and so we married. But there was no divorce. It was two years later before Robards received the divorce decree. We wasted no time in getting properly and legally married. That mistake would follow us, and eventually we'd pay for it in heartbreak. When Rachel learned that I had won the presidential election, she said, well, for Mr. Jackson's sake, I am glad. For my own part, I never wished it. She went to Nashville one day to buy a wardrobe suitable for a first lady to wear and happened to see a campaign pamphlet that de had defended our behavior. She had known the kinds of slander and accusations that had been leveled about the circumstances of our marriage. Bigamy? Adultery? She was overwhelmed, literally sickened. Not long after that, she had two attacks of excruciating pain in her chest and her arm and died. My heart was nearly broke. A loss so great can't be compensated by no earthly gift. We buried Rachel on Christmas Eve on the grounds of the hermitage. My inauguration was to be March 4th, so I was forced to turn my attentions to the responsibilities that awaited me in Washington. 
I had a reform program set. Uh, listen to this. Strict limits on government spending eliminate the national debt, provide a reasonable tariff, and distribute any excess to the states for education, get rid of corrupt officials, and support states' rights and the sovereignty of the states. I also wanted to create a just and liberal policy towards the Indians, which as far as I was concerned, was removal. But first, there was Inauguration Day. And if you weren't there, I'm sure you've heard the stories. <laughs> and the best part is, they're all true. For the first time, the ceremony was to be held on the East Portico. And what a perfect day it was for it. Bright and sunny, not too cold. When I stepped out onto the portico, I was stunned. People, thousands and thousands of people everywhere, screaming and shouting, hooray for old Hickory. Long live the hero of New Orleans. General Jackson, our president. I was overcome and deeply humbled. What could I do but bow to the will of the people who had elected me to serve them? After I was sworn in, we left for the White House, followed by every kind of person you can imagine. Male, female, white, black, rich, poor, polished, and common, all poured into the White House. In their enthusiasm for getting a closer look at me or shaking my hand, they nearly crushed me. I slipped away, but the celebration continued, and wild and reckless it was. Crystal and china were broken, upholstery ruined with mud. One senator called it, a regular Saturnalia. <laughs> here's, a, here's a newspaper report. Uh, it was a proud day for the people. General Jackson is their own president, plain in his dress, venerable in his appearance, unaffected and familiar in his manner. He was greeted by them with an enthusiasm which bespoke him the hero of a popular triumph. The people were excited. They had created a government. They'd chosen their own man to oversee it, and I was eager to get to work. Early on, I chose John Henry Eaton for my cabinet. I've heard no end of criticism for it, but by heaven, the man's been an aide and a friend to me for as long as I can remember. Once I told Rachel, he was more like a son to me than anything else. Is it so odd that I'd want such a person for my cabinet? The problem was Eaton's new bride, Margaret Timberlake. She had a reputation of as being a woman of questionable morals. But Eaton loved her. Unfortunately, the wives of the other cabinet members would have nothing to do with her. Even my niece and official hostess, Emily Donaldson, would only receive her at the White House. She would not, under any circumstances, call on her in her own home. I took considerable offense at the treatment of Peggy Eaton. At first, I thought she was the victim of lies spread about by the minions of Mr. Clay. Then I was certain it was nothing but females unduly influenced by the clergy. I had no idea at the time it would affect who would ultimately succeed me. In any case, my protection of her as a woman and the wife of a loyal friend was guaranteed. 
And secondly, they were not the first couple, in my experience, to be the victims of vicious slander and gossip. No other woman would have to tolerate what Rachel Jackson did if I could prevent it. Some say this position could have cost me my presidency. Well, so be it if it did. I told my cabinet, I will not part with Major Eaton, and those who cannot harmonize with him had better withdraw the harmony I must have. And who should have been standing with me in these vexations? My Vice President, John Calhoun, but he was not. He was doing his best to disgrace me, to weaken my administration and lessen my standing with the people who had elected me. Calhoun opposed me in every way imaginable, but the last straw was the nullification issue. A state does not have the right to declare a federal law null and void. Calhoun and his fellow South Carolinians can get themselves up in arms about violation of state rights all they want to. But nullification, secession, I'd rather die in the last ditch than see the Union disunited. It all came about because of a huge tariff on imported European goods. They call the tariff of abominations. Its whole purpose was to protect northern industry. And I didn't think much of it either, but I wasn't going to allow it to destroy the Union. I sent word to South Carolina, if a single drop of blood be shed there in opposition to the laws of the United States, I will hang the first man I can lay my hands on engaged in such treasonable conduct upon the first tree I can reach. So the matter was settled for a while, but it wasn't over. And by the time we negotiated a tariff compromise in 1832, the South Carolinians had passed an ordinance of nullification. They were determined to confront the federal government if it meant civil war. I immediately wrote a proclamation to the people of South Carolina. Here it is. Those who told you that you might peaceably prevent their execution deceived you. They could not have been deceived themselves. Their object is disunion. But be not deceived by names. Disunion by armed force is treason. Are you really ready to incur its guilt? If you are, and on the heads of the instigators of the act be the dreadful consequences. On their heads be the dishonor, but on yours may fall the punishment. On your unhappy state will inevitably fall all the evils of the conflict you will force upon the government of your country. I adjure you to retrace your steps. The power of one state to annul a law of the United States is completely incompatible with the existence of the Union. The federal government is based on a confederation of perpetual union by an act of the people. It is the people, not the states, who grant sovereignty through the Constitution. There is no right on the part of a state to nullify. There is no right to secede. The Constitution and the laws are supreme and the Union indissoluble. Without Union, our independence and liberty would never have been achieved. Without Union, it can never be maintained. 
the loss of liberty, of all good government, of peace, plenty, and happiness must inevitably follow the dissolution of the Union. And so, for now, nullification is dead. The next pretext will be the slavery issue. Adams and Calhoun will try to raise the issue in another attempt to destroy the Union. But we're not even going to discuss it. It's a private property matter. The Constitution clearly allows it. It's settled. Nullifiers, abolitionists, secessionists, Indians. I don't care who you are, you do not threaten this nation. I grew up under the tyranny of Britain. I was a 13-year-old prisoner of war. I still wear the scars and the sword of a British soldier who commanded I clean his boots. I fought for our glorious union against the Creeks, the Seminoles, the Spanish, the British. When I lived in the wilderness of Tennessee, I saw just what the federal government was willing to do about the Indian menace. Nothing. That's what. Settlers were attacked. Innocent people murdered. Here's my letter to Congressman John McKee. What motives Congress are governed by with respect to their pacific disposition towards Indians, I know not. Some say humanity dictates it, but certainly she ought to extend an equal share of humanity to her own citizens. In doing this, Congress would act justly and punish the barbarians for murdering her innocent citizens. I worked for statehood for Tennessee so we could solve the problem ourselves. In the War of 1812, the Creeks fought with the British against us. After those experiences, I was determined that Indians could not jeopardize the military safety of the United States. And just as important, if you are going to live in a state, then you are subject to the laws of that state. If an Indian tribe lives within what is a sovereign entity, it cannot be a sovereign entity itself. They needed to either become American citizens and behave accordingly. Well, they needed to move somewhere where they could pursue their ancient customs and habits. If they stay, their culture will be lost. They will be extinct. A removal is the only alternative. And so I signed the Indian Removal Act. I could have ignored the problem like everybody else before me, but I had a duty to act. After I did, the American people were better off, and so were the Indians. There had been a lot of disagreement about it in Congress, but once it was done, there was no overwhelming protest from the public. I think the people didn't care what was done. They were just relieved they didn't have to live in fear anymore. In the midst of the War of 1812, I was ordered to dismiss my Tennessee volunteers and send them home. 2,000 men in the wilderness with no money, no food, no medicine, no transport. I told those imbeciles in Washington I didn't care what their orders were. My men marched with me from Nashville to Natchez, and I would carefully march them home. And I did, 500 miles on foot. 
My men said I was tough, hard as anything you can imagine, like hickory wood. So they called me Old Hickory, a name I'm proud to be called to this day. When I fought the Creeks, an Indian baby was found on the battleground with its dead mother and brought to me. I asked some of the other Indian women to care for him, but they wouldn't. They said all his relatives are dead. Kill him too. I knew something about being alone in the world with no kin, and I wasn't about to do any such thing. So, then Coyle became my son. Never quite gave up all his Indian traits. I remember one time the other children came running and screaming into the house because he had painted his face like a warrior and jumped out the bushes out. <laughs> I wanted to send him to West Point, the best school in the country. I've often wondered if he'd been able to attend West Point would he have become a military man like me? Would Len Corey have had his own battle of New Orleans in which to prove himself? The battle of New Orleans. All I have to do is close my eyes and think of that day, and I can smell the gunpowder. It was January 8th, 1815 just before dawn. A mist from the Mississippi River covered the ground. On the far side of the field, the British Army. On the near side, low in a ditch, the Americans. Sharpshooters, frontiersmen, army regulars, pirates, blacks. I took a central position and stood behind my men, surveying the situation to the left and to the right. All were armed. Their weapons pointed straight ahead. As the light of day began to spread, the mist dissipated. There they stood, the British, in their brilliant red coats spread out across the field. Suddenly, scurry! A Congreve rocket shot up from one flank. Then, just as suddenly, scurry! Another one from the other flank. I shouted, give it to them, my boys. Let us finish the business today. With Yankee Doodle playing in the background, we fired our shots. They kept coming, and we fired again. Suddenly, they stopped. They turned, unable to face what they saw. Their commander, Lieutenant General Packenham, came up from the rear screaming at them, for shame, for shame, recollect that you are British soldiers. The sharpshooters fired. One hit Packenham's arm, the other killed his horse. He mounted the Nade's pony and chased after his men. They returned to the battlefield along with a column of 900 tartanted Highlanders. The men in the ditch responded instantly, firing, 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 musketry, rifle, buckshot. Round after round into the British troops, packing them was shot, died under an oak tree in the center of the field. The Highlanders took the bar barrage of fire until more than 500 were felled, and those that were left turned and retreated too. When what was left of the British and the Highlanders was out of range, I called for a ceasefire. Jubilant shouts were heard down the line. Congratulations to each other, applause for me, but when they climbed the parapet behind the ditch that they had built, and when they wandered about the field of battle, 
they were silenced by the horror. The dead and wounded lay in heaps, and the ground upon which they lay was colored red. That was the end of the War of 1812. I like to savor the memory of those final days in New Orleans after the war. The people considered me a hero. There was peace. And then, best of all, Rachel and our son Andrew arrived. A grand ball was held in my honor, and I can still hear the strains of possum up the gum tree as I danced my Rachel around the room. Possum up. The gum tree, coonie on the stump. Possum up the gum tree, coonie on the stump. Oh, oh. <laughs> I think my dancing days may be over. I'll be here for a few more days until after Van Buren's inauguration. Just time enough to rest up for the train trip home. I look forward to being back in the Hermitage again. It's been completely rebuilt, you know. The fire a few years ago did so much damage. I would have had it rebuilt higher up the hill, except its site is the one Rachel chose for it. I was told that the people of New Orleans wanted to have it rebuilt. But I said, no, I could afford the work myself. I told my son, Andrew Jr., who lives there and oversaw the reconstruction, to use his own judgment about the alterations. I told him all I wanted was a good room to which I can retire if I am spared to live out my irksome term here. And I'm sure I shall not want that room long. Uh, that's probably true. My health has been poor for a long time. It's a bullet that Charles Dickinson put into me when we dueled. It's caused all the trouble. Had I not been wearing a loose coat, a bullet probably would have killed me. As it was, it struck me too near the heart to be removed. I've suffered many severe hemorrhages as a result. The doctor bleeds me, but doesn't seem to help. Rachel suffered from poor health, too. Her doctor prescribed a pipe to give her relief from her consumption, but sometimes she would smoke cigars instead. <laughs> Quite a few people were stunned to see a woman do such a thing. Of course, we lost Lynn Coyer to consumption when he was only 16. When Rachel died, she was still mourning his loss. I believe that divine providence has brought me safely to this day. When I get home, I will probably join the Presbyterian Church. I promised Rachel I would, but I thought, Parading my religion in public might seem a bit hypocritical. I had no intention of being accused of joining the church for political effect. So I will wait until after I retire when no false imputations can be made that might be injurious to religion. I'm not sure I can accept all the Presbyterian tenets, though. An elect? Chosen of God? That's a philosophy that just doesn't square with me at all. The planter, the farmer, the mechanic, the laborer form the great body of the people of the United States. They are the bone and sinew of the country. 
men who love liberty and desire nothing but equal rights and equal laws. Those are the people I'll speak to tomorrow when I make my farewell address. I'm concerned, naturally, how history will judge me. But I'm more concerned about how those I've served for the last eight years will judge me. I want this speech to be a reminder of the most important principle of our government. The sovereignty of the country rests with you, the people. To you, everyone placed in authority is ultimately responsible. It is always in your power to see that your wishes are carried into faithful execution and your will, once made known, must sooner or later be obeyed. If the people remain uncorrupted and uncorruptible, the cause of freedom will triumph over all its enemies. Listen, you can see what you think. You have the highest of human trust committed to your care. Providence has showered on this favored land blessings without number and has chosen you as the guardians of freedom to preserve it for the benefit of the human race. May he who holds in his hands the destinies of nations make you worthy of the favors he has bestowed and enable you with pure hearts and pure hands and sleepless vigilance to guard and defend to the end of time the great charge he has committed to your keeping. My own race is nearly run. I thank God that my life has been spent in a land of liberty and that he has given me the heart to love my country with the affection of a son. And filled with gratitude for your constant and unwavering kindness, I bid you a last and affectionate farewell. Friends, did you hear it? The clock has just struck 12. I am no longer president of the United States, but as good a citizen as any of you. Hear, hear. hear, hear. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to retire for the evening. I will gaze upon the face of my dearest heart, my Rachel. I will read a bit from her Bible and then go to bed. You should think about getting some rest too. Tomorrow's going to be a very exciting day. Thank you all for stopping by to see me. Good night. <laughs>